Welcome, everybody. We have another episode against the grain podcast. We're going to go straight into this episode. I have brother Robert in the house. Brother Robert, thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Formerly known as Big Limpy <laughs> from White Fence, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. I've, I've been seeing your testimony. You're on YouTube. I've, I've known you for a long time. Yeah. You're a great friend to me. Um, just our connection. I remember, I'll never forget the first time we met was at Praise Chapel in Whittier. Yeah. My wife and I, our team, we led worship that day. I'll never forget, you came up to me and you were like, what is your story? Where are you guys from? The worship. You're like, you guys worship your heart for the Lord. You prayed for us. And ever since then, we've been connected and I stuff. I remember. But give us an intro for it yourself, was a powerful Brother Robert. Moment. I remember that. I yeah, was it was good. I, I felt the Holy Spirit move right there. It was good. That whole service, man, was awesome. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that was the time that Ryan came from, um, I think he came from uh, Victory Outreach. I think that was the service that he went, he preached that time from Whittier. But, um, but anyways, Brother Robert, thanks for being here. Thanks hey, for being on the podcast. I want to reach out to you. You have an amazing story, amazing what you're doing now for the Lord. But I want you to take us all the way back. I want you to take us all the way back, introduce yourself, where you're from, kind of growing up and everything. Wow. So I, um, I grew up in uh, Boyle Heights. Uh, I was born in General Hospital, 1959, gives up my age. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, God has been good, been graceful. I grew up in... Uh, uh, Soto and Wabash at that time. Mm. Uh, back then it was Brooklyn and Soto. Yep. You know, uh, running the streets, you know, uh, getting involved with a bunch of stuff. But uh, um, in my earlier days in that, I grew up in Aliso Village, Pico Gardens. Mm. You know, I uh, I grew up in uh, the Cuatro Flats projects. Mm. Um, I was there when they, some people will remember the Free Los Tres. Mm. Uh, the cops came to the projects and uh, the guys were running around and they took one of the guns from the cops, shot really? him and killed him. Wow. And I, I could hear the cops yelling and, and, and the guys yelling and there was a big mayhem that night. You know, wow. it became a big thing. Uh, politically um, and on the news um, for a long time, and uh, I knew those guys, wow. you know. And I think as a kid, you know, that those were my first introductions to um, to gang life. Mm. You know, at a young age, uh, I was in elementary school. You know, I was going to Second Street School at that time, mm. and a bunch of us from the projects we used to get together and walk out of the projects up Fourth Street over the bridge. To Boyle Avenue, mm. and then cut across and go over to the to the elementary school. Wow! And um, yeah, that that was that's my introduction to how things were on the streets. You know, um, as a matter of fact, um, I have a memory with the Sixth Street Bridge because mm. they just redid uh, it. Yeah, well, we used to go through the projects and through the back and through the factories, mm. and there's the 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 bridge was right there, and, yeah. and we used to go, and there was a, a tunnel. And we used to go through the tunnel and cut across the five freeway underneath, really? underneath the freeway. Wow. And we used to go underneath and we used to go up mm. and we used to sit under that bridge. Wow. And we used to just kick it and, you know, do our thing or yeah. whatever. And then we used to get back. And so to me, when they, they said they were going to tear it down, I was like, no, yeah. no. But to me, it's historical, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, but, for sure. uh, you know, old things have to come and new things have to come, you Amen. know what I mean? Amen. And uh, just like us, you know. So with, with Aliso Village right there, you have a you have like Primera Flats is right there. You said Fourth as well too. Yeah. What was it like growing up right there at that time? It must have been pretty crazy, right? Yeah, you know, because uh, uh, Cuatro Flats was in those projects, and across the way at that time, Primera Flats was there. Mm. You know, um, they uh, ended up uh, on the other side was uh, over there like Brooklyn and Soto. When I grew, when I left there, I ended up going with my grandmother mm. over there in Soto and Wabash, and. Uh, um, so we had uh, Tercera. I was from White Fence, you know. Uh, I was from White Fence and Primera Flats and Tercera, Barrio Nuevo, yep. you know, Loyo Mara. We had all those neighborhoods around, you know, and, and uh, those were well-known neighborhoods. Yeah. And uh, after a while, they just became just so many crews and, mm. you know, taggers, and it changed, mm. you know, um, back then and uh but yeah you know it was, it, it was a trip you know how did you like what, what was your introduction to like the gang like like what made you want to join you have friends family like what was the thing that kind of drew you in and, well, and why white fence because white uh, fence they're well known i mean if anyone doesn't know about them yeah one of the biggest oldest hispanic Nin 1939 man i um i got in i since i was a kid i was always enthralled with the low riders you mm. know with the chicano power uh, the early days, you know, um, they had the patches, Viva La Raza, the Chicano Power patch, 
the Mexican flag, you know, oldies, 45s, mm. you know, the used to get the, the albums from uh, Radio Express. They oh, came wow. from Baja California, mm. you know, uh, used to get the albums with all the, all the oldies, you know. Mm. And, uh, and so I was always, I, I always liked that, you know. So I was always infatuated with it growing up. And that became my lifestyle, mm. you know. Um, I was like one of those guys uh, from the movie Stand and Deliver, the homeboy. He had books all over, yeah. you know, but he still wanted to be a homeboy, but yeah. he studied. He had, he, had, he had books in his locker, had books at home. Yeah, so yeah. They wouldn't see he him didn't around. Him, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but he ended up having the highest GPA. Yeah, Angel. Yeah, he Man. had the highest, you know, he ended up having the highest grade average, you know. Um, and I, I was kind of like that, you know, I, I wanted to do the street thing, but at the same time, I, I was willing to do homework. I was willing to do stuff and um, apply myself to something, you know, even though I was more in the gangs, you know, growing up, you know, I went to Holland Back Junior High School after Second Street, and I went to Roosevelt High School for about a week. Really? And I ended up getting into it, to, getting into it with a teacher, and I got thrown out, and I ended up at Jackson High School. The all-boys school? The all-boys school. Oh, man. I ended up there. You know, the guys from Jackson and the girls from Ramona. Ramona was an all-girls school, mm. you know. And um, all the bad kids from all over L.A. ended up at Jackson, you know. It was one of those things that when... Um, when you go to the restroom, you know, you had to take a homeboy with you. You know, Man. you couldn't even take a piss, you know, without wow. getting beat up or jumped, you know, or something, you know, something going on. There was always fights. There was always stuff going on. Teachers didn't come wow. to teach. You know, it was bad back then, you know, back Man. in the 70s, you know, mm. uh, catching the RTD, you know, it was the RTD back then. Now it's Metro. Metro. Yeah. What was your, what was your family like growing up? Like, uh, what was your parents' situation, brothers, sisters? What was that like? Um, my mom, she was a single mom. There was five of us. Uh, I'm the eldest. Um, we were growing up in the projects, you know, uh, back in them days, you know, moving around, struggling, you know, food stamps, welfare, you know, uh, living off the government, you mm. know, free cheese, free, mm. free stuff like that, you know. Uh, um, so, yeah, we, with my mom grew up like that. And my mom, uh, you know, she had to do what she had to do to, to support us, to survive, you know, um, whatever she had to do, you know, mm -hmm. um, me, um, growing up, you know, I used to run away. I used to take off, you know, I used to, I used to run the streets because, um, I didn't want her to worry about me, about mm -hmm. feeding me, about taking care of me. So I hit the streets, you know, and I figured, uh, uh, that's how I would do it, you know, and, and people have asked me, you know, how do you think gangs formed? Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't necessarily just the street, the area that you lived in. But I personally believe that uh, a lot of guys um, and girls growing up in dysfunctional families, mm. you know, they uh, they were going through the same thing. So moms or dad was they go outside, go play, you know, yeah. go out, you know. And I think that all the troubled kids, they got together. Mm. And I think that's how, how it formed. You know, we're from... We're from the something projects. We're from yeah. this street. We're yep. from that street. And I believe that's how gangs were formed, mm. you know, um, basically, you know. And uh, a, lot of those, a lot of those guys became more family than they did with their family families mm. because they weren't wanted by their families. You know, wow. they weren't wanted by their mom or dad or you were just a waste of time or you yeah. were an accident, you know. Mm. And, and that was a demeanor to a person's personality growing up. Mm. You know, that shoots you down instead yeah. of saying you could be a spaceman, you could be a doctor, you could yeah. be a, a lawyer. Instead, you know, you're going to end up in jail, you're going to end mm. up on drugs, you know. Yeah. So they prophesied that stuff to Speaking us. Speaking death. Not yep. knowing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, did you know your dad growing up at all? Or? No, I never knew my never dad. Never met nothing? Never met my dad, man, mm. you know. And so um, uh, I have some people that have told me they met him, mm. you know, but uh, I never pursued looking for him. I never, you know you know, looked for him or nothing. I figured he's not in my life. That's the way it's going to be. You know what I mean? Mm. So I ended up growing up real fast because there was five of us. You know, it's myself, my brother, my sister, my brother, and a sister. You're the oldest. Yeah, and I thank God that because of a lot of stuff that I went through, they didn't go through. They mm. they all they all have very, very good jobs, career, good. careers now. That's amazing. You know, I was a, I was a jack of all trade, a master of none. You know, <laughs> I, I learned everything, mm. you know. I had to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was uh, what was it like actually like getting into the neighborhood with white fence and everything? Because 
like you know people you see in the movies right like you getting jumped in all this and that what was it like actually like getting in yeah what was I, it like kind of early i remember uh we were in an alley uh and that alley it's off of uh it's off of evergreen mm. and uh you go up the, across right across the street from the cemetery right on that corner there's right an there. alley that goes up and in the back there's a dojo mm. and there was a place where we used to go hang out and kick it and I remember the day that uh, we went back there and uh, the homeboy said, it's time for you, homeboy, to get in the neighborhood. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, you're getting in today, you know. Mm. And then uh, so for 13 seconds, you know, they, uh, we went at it, Man. you know, went at it, swinging away, you know what I mean? And after all, all you know, messed up my hair and tatted up and bloody and whatever, you know, you're giving hugs and high fives and welcome to the neighborhood. You know, and so that's what I lived for back then. You know, it was something I was I was a part of, I belonged to. Mm. I felt wanted, you know, I felt needed, mm. you know, for something, you know, that uh, I felt that was a purpose of my life at that time. Wow. You know, so we, we uh, you know, but little did I know that it was just going to start a life of crime, of drugs, addiction, you know, alcoholism, you know, women, you know, jail life, mm. you know. And uh, through all that, you know, um, um, I've given 45 years of my life. You know, I was 10 years old already in the back of a cop car. Wow. You know, juvenile halls and camps and stuff like that, you know. How, so how, how did that all start as far as, like, your jail time? Like you said, you spent so much, so much time, serious time in prison. How did it start and what was kind of like, what, what was some of the things that you were kind of charged with? And things like that? Because you, you've done, like I said, some serious time. Yeah, I've, I've always picked up robberies and burglaries, you know. I've always picked up, you know, uh, um, stuff like that, you know, uh, robbing people on the streets, mm. you know. Um, just, you know, just because there, it was to, to support a habit, mm. you know what I mean? It was just to, to have money, you know. We didn't know the ethics of work. Mm. We didn't know the, we didn't really have anybody there to say, hey, you know, go to school, you know, which we did. People would, you know, get a job, you know, go, go to school, you know, get an education. But you're growing up in the neighborhood, you know, and you got the homeboys, peer pressure, mm. you know, you know, nah, homeboy, that's not for us. This is it. Vida loca, tres puntos, you know, all yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah. you know. And, uh, and so that's what we pursued, you know. Uh, you know, a, a life of crime, you know, uh, and uh, started going to, uh, to Juvenile Hall. You know, I've been to, uh, I've been to Juvenile Halls in, in Wyoming. I've been to Ju wow. Juvenile Halls in, uh, um, in Arizona um, and uh, California, you know, and then uh, camps and, uh, you know, county jail. And I was in and out of that county jail like nothing, man, wow. you know. I remember that I, I had been so involved with crime and, and the street life that the first time I went to the county jail, um, they asked me, you know, they had they had said, you know, what's this, your your fifth, sixth time already? Wow. How many times have you been here already, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I would tell them, oh, this is my first time. Mm -hmm. And they were like, shut up, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're tripping, you know, yeah. yeah. And it was my first time. Mm. But I was so involved with things of the neighborhood, the people around me that I fit right in. Mm. You know, that glove just went smoothly into my hand. You know, I was like, I belong there. You know, it was like part of my life. Yeah. What was the, uh, what was the one of the, some of the ser uh, more serious charges that you ended up getting a lot of time for? And what, what years was this? Um, in 2000, I picked up uh, two attempted murders in Echo Park. Wow. Um, I just posted the picture of that. I found that picture of that restaurant. Oh, where it happened at. Right. Yeah, I saw right. that. What was the story? What, 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 uh, if, you can, was, if you can it, talk about it. It, it, was, uh, it was a Marisco's place. Mm. And that morning, uh, we went there to go pick up a package, a, d a delivery. And, um, and we were waiting. And uh, so we decided to get a you know, shrimp cocktail, a couple of beers, you know. And, um, and so my, my friend that I was with, you know, that we were picking up the package with, I was the cortero. I had mm. the gun. You know, anything goes down, I'm going to start shooting. Mm. And uh, he says, you know what, I don't want this beer. He goes, why don't you get me a soda? And I go, yeah, for sure, man. You know, so I got up and I went in and, and um, uh, to get him a soda, you know. And, and I saw these two guys sitting there, you know, and I looked, you know, and I says, I know that dude, man, from somewhere, mm. you know. And then so we came back. No, I, that's when I first got the beer and I saw them. Mm. And I went back and I told Casper and I told him, hey, you know what? I, go, I, I recognize these dudes, man. Mm. I go, I think that's one of the guys that stabbed me on the bus. Really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, what do you want to do? I go, I'm going to go confront him right now, man. Mm. 
And so I had the nine, the nine millimeter on me, and I went up to his table, sitting the way we were, mm. and I'm standing right here. Mm. And I looked at him. I go, hey, how's it going? I said, I go, you remember me? And he looked at me, and he goes, nah. He goes, am I supposed to? And I mm. go, that's not important. I go, I remember you. Wow. And I ran the story to him. Uh, what, hap- what happened? H- him and his buddies. What happened was I was working in Bel Air and Beverly Hills. I was doing stonework. Oh, really? And um, I had to go to 3rd and La Brea to go drop off some money to my aunt and then catch the bus back to Boyle Heights. So I went across the street. There's a, there's a Ralph's market right there. Mm. I went and I got me a, a, a six pack of Coronas. Mm. And I was sitting at the bus stop and I'm waiting for the bus and I'm drinking these beers. The bus comes, I get on and it takes off through West LA and it goes through a, a, a certain area um, you know, Pico Union area, mm. you know, and these two guys got on the bus, man, and they were like all loud, and I was in the middle of the bus, and they started talking to me, man. You know, they started giving me a bunch of stuff and, 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 and talking crazy to me, and um, and then, you know, I, I don't know what it was, and then he told me, he says, F your mother. Wow. And then I told him, I go, well, you know what? I go, I'm just coming from your mother's house right now. And I, oh, and I pulled up no. my pants, you know, mm. like I said, and she was good, bro. Oh, man. And he looked at me, and that was on and cracking then. Man. You know what I mean? I told him, you know, and, I, and so he got up, I got up, and I, I had, that night, I always had a buck knife, mm. you know, and every morning at work with the rock, I, shy, I sharpened it with water or oil. I would mm. sharpen it, you know. So I didn't use the knife that day. Wow. So the knife was sharp. Yeah. So we used to cut the plaster together. You know, I didn't use it. And so I pulled my knife out. And when, when I moved, this guy, this guy made a move, and I, I sliced him. I really? went like that, like Zorro. Mm. I, I, you know, I went like that. And he had a white T-shirt on, just like me right now. Mm. And you could just see the blood coming through. It, you know, I, I slid him, wow. you know. And he just freaked out because I think he felt the slices. Mm. And then... The other guy turned to look at him, the guy that was talking stuff to me. Yeah. He looked at the other guy, and when he looked at the other guy, I stabbed him. Man. And when I stabbed him, this guy stabbed me. Mm. You know, he hit me twice right here. And so there's a big old commotion going, and when everything was going down, the guy threw a beer. They had beer, too. Mm. And they threw a beer at me, and it hit me in the side of my face, and I spun around, and that's when the guy hit me. Mm. That's when he stabbed me, mm. and the beer hit, and it's where you put, you, back then at the bus, the you money. put the money yep. inside. Coins. Yeah, and so um, it hit that, and then you just, I, I remember a lady yelling, ay, Dios mio, oh my God, you know, mm. and the bus driver, and he stopped the bus, but we were already like by 6th and Broadway, over there, and, and uh, he opened the doors, and the guys got out, and they ran, and and I, I I just real calm, bro, wow. real calm. You know, I just put my my arm over the hole and I walked up to the front of the bus and I told the guy, hey, I go, uh, can you do me a favor and call whoever you need to? I go, I, I'm stabbed, bro. Mm. And I sat right behind him on the seat. And I just sat there, wow. and I just held on, you know. And I and I just remember for some reason that song by the Izzy Brothers, "Fight the Power." Oh, really? I remember that song, "Fight the Power," "Fight wow. it," "Fight it," "Fight mm. it." You know, I wasn't saved back then. You yeah. know, I just was into the energy, the the you know karma and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. And and I'm holding the I'm holding the hole, and the fire department comes, and you know they take me to the hospital, and and um, and I ended up getting surgery on my stomach. I have three really? holes. I have three holes here. Wow. You know, and uh, and so anyway. Uh, so you see the same guy that that stabbed you. How many years later? So so ten years ten later. Years. I run into him at the Marisco's place, mm. and that's when I said, hey, hey Casper, I, go, I recognize this guy. I know this guy from someplace. You still remembered him, And huh? I remembered his face, man, and he just looked at me when I told him, the, when I ran the story down to him. I go, as a matter of fact, I go, I sliced you on the chest. Oh. And that's when his eyes lit up like a deer in the headlights, So he went like, you know. And I go, that was him. He goes, why are you tripping? That's it. And I go, no, Uncle, I'm just let you know I remember you, man, mm. you know. And then and I go, you know what? As a matter of fact, I'm going to be waiting for you outside, man. Mm. And so he came out, bro. And what does he do? He pulled out a knife. Mm. I go, you're still pulling out knives? And I reached in. I grabbed the 9 millimeter. And as close as we are, I went like that to him. And I pulled the trigger. Wow. And it didn't go off. 
Wow, really? I didn't shoot them. In my heart, in my mind, I killed them. Mm. I, I had them dead, mm. you know, I, and I pulled the trigger and it didn't go off. What happened was when I was sitting down, mm -hmm. I couldn't figure it out, but I had hit the button and the clip came out. Oh my so I gosh. think that was the hand of God right there. Yeah, on his life. You oh, know, you too. I mean, little, you killed him. Little did I know. Yeah. You know. Man. And so he runs. I get the gun to go into my homeboy's yelling at me, shoot, shoot. And I finally shot 13 times. I emptied it out. Bah, bah, bah. I just went, man. Such an adrenaline, you know. And, um, and so two weeks later on Father's Day, you know, um, there's just a connection with me and Father's Day. I've had two serious incidents happen to me on Father's Day. Wow. You know, um, so they arrested me. <clears throat> the lady that was in behind me, I accidentally stepped on her and I turned around and said, excuse me. Mm. So she got a look at me. Mm. So when I got arrested on Father's Day for drinking, I was shooting the gun on Father's Day. Oh, really? And the cops came and uh, they arrested me. And they, there was one of the shells that I shot matched the uh, the bullet from when I shot uh, those guys. Did you hit? Did you hit them? When yeah. You, when you shot yeah, the I, I, I hit him. Oh wow! I hit him in the back. I shattered the window of the truck. Mm. I mean, I had dead on aim, man. You know, and I can't lift this arm, so I was mm. with one arm, one hand only. You know, and I hit him in the back. I shattered the window, blew the truck up. They were under the the, the Hollywood Freeway, that bridge on Alvarado. Yeah. Mm. And um, yeah, and so I instead of see where I did the shooting across the street, there's a hill where yeah. the where the freeway off off ramp is Alvarado. Mm -hmm. There's a hill and there's a fence, but mm. it has a hole, and that takes me straight to my house. Mm. But I said to myself, if I go that way, they're gonna say he went that way. Mm. You're gonna take the cops that way. Yeah. So what I did was like a rabbit. He comes out of the hole and he does a circle. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I ran up to Temple Navarro. I went up. I went to Hill. I went around. And I saw Homeboy driving by. And he got in. He got, yeah, I go, hey. And then he goes, is that you? And I go, that was me, man. Wow. And it, it's literally what they say, Echo Park, because it echoed. Man. You could hear those shots. It rang. And you don't have to say specifically, but these guys, they were from a neighborhood? Yeah. Oh, okay, they that's were, why you guys got into it? from a rival mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh, from that time. So anyway, so then um, I get arrested and um, um, I'm going to court. I'm looking at 56 to life, you know, and I'm going back and forth to court, you know, and, uh, you know, my life's over. That's it. It ends, you know, it's, this is how I do it, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up taking a 14-year deal. Wow. I remember being in a table like this on a chair and I was handcuffed to it. And I told him, you know, I told him, can you get me a deal, some kind of deal, man? You know, because they were coming at me with 56 to life. So he goes, and then he comes back, and he says, well, he says, um, <clears throat> the only deal I can get you is 14 years. Mm. To me, that's an eternity still. Yeah, you 14. know, I'm like, no, nah, man, you know, go check it out, man. And he goes, I'll go try. And he goes, but you know what? He goes, I, I doubt it, but this is, I, you know, I, if I were you, I'm going to go talk to your family. So he had a bunch of stuff on the desk and papers and stuff, and then he had some pictures, an envelope with a brown, a brown envelope. Mm. And he goes, he goes, looked at me kind of like telling me, I'm going to leave those pictures right there. Mm. And he goes, I'll be right back. He goes, I'm going to leave those pictures right there, kind of telling me, yeah, like, yeah, look at them. them. You know? So they were like over there, and then he takes off, and I scoot the chair over, I'm handcuffed, and I grab the pictures. And they had me dead on, bro. Really? My picture, my face, the whole nine yards. They, they got me like, like I'm, I'm looking like, you know, like I had death on my face. I was like, you know. Is that from the cameras that were that, there or Yeah, something, from or? The, the area, uh-huh. Yeah, Man. from the ca cameras, uh-huh. And so um, when he came back, I told him, I'll sign. Mm. I'll take the 14 years. And so uh, I remember um, going to the county. I remember, uh, you know, going to Wasco State Prison. And um, from there, uh, they balance your points, you know, what you have, what you don't have, what you did, and then they add them up. So I had like, uh, like uh, 59, 60 points. So that was enough to send me to maximum security to level four, uh, 180 yard. Wow. It's, uh, it's one yard, but it's split in half. Mm. You, there's no hiding. The, gun, the guy can shoot you anywhere. Mm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and so I ended up going to uh, Corcoran, uh, state prison, uh, level four, 180. I was there for a minute. Um, that was a trip. You know, that, that was straight, that was straight war right there. What's it like going in? Cause obviously, you know, South siders, you're with the Southerners and stuff. And from my understanding, for those that don't know, it doesn't matter what street you're from out here. As soon as you go on your versa, everyone's together, right? Yeah. Sur is Sureño, right? You know, you're from the South, but you know, we break it down the Sur right here. I have it. 
It's Southern United Race. Mm. You know, this tattoo, the suit right here, it, it was done with a paper clip, a toothbrush, um, a chest piece. Um, it was burnt, uh, paper wrapped around it, and, and the ink flies off the paper, and you scrape the paper off, and you get a toothpaste cap, and you put the, the powder in there, a little bit of water, a little bit of toothpaste, mix it, and... Start poking away. And I had 13 lines. You can see the little dots still, but it, it kind of, like, you know, so that was my... You know, it was kind of saying, like, now, now you're going to earn that, mm. you know, to, to have that, you know. Mm. And um, I remember that. I was, uh, you know, I went in and, uh, you know, being in prison is not easy. Mm. It, 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 there's just a special person that, that's made for it. But like I told you earlier, you know, when I went to the county, it was like I fit it right in. Yeah. I was right, like I was made for it, mm. you know. Little did I know, I thought... You know, being a, a gangster was my calling, was who I was. My brother, um, he was in the military, you know, physician's assistant. Mm. You know, he took medical. You know, my other brother, you know, he's a UPS driver, went to high school, football, you know. Um, and my other sister, you know, she's a general manager, you know, for uh, her, her, her company, uh, Select Staffing. Mm. You know, my other sister, she's, she's, she massages, she went to school. You know, she's had knee surgeries right now, so she's laid back. And me, well, I was the, the, the jack of all trades, master of none. Mm. You know, I, I picked and nicked at everything in life, you know. So I, I it's kind of crazy because I think, you know, I've learned more than a person does in college. Well, wow. You know, because I was on the job training. Yeah. I learned firsthand it. And to where I'm at now in my life, it, it's coming to help. It's coming to help me to do what I do in my ministries and what I do, because you know I'm all over the yeah, place. Yeah, you're out there. Man, praying for people I see all over social media. Where's God? Before you get saved, where's God in your life in all this? Are you, I know you didn't necessarily, you weren't like necessarily saved, but did you believe in God? Would you pray to him when things are crazy? Did, what, what was your belief with God before you actually got saved during this whole time? Well, you know, grow, growing up, we were Catholic. You know, we were diehard Catholic. And I didn't like Catholic churches for mm. some reason or another. I just didn't like them. I didn't like, it just seemed so dreary, so dark, mm. so dull to me. You know, uh, the catechism, you know, the, 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 you know, I had to go to that, you know, first communion. You know, I did all that, you know. Um, to go to church, you had to kneel down. You had to do yeah. this. You had to, the rosary. You had to do all, it was so ritual. Mm. And for some reason growing up, I didn't like it. So I... I, I knew about God, but I didn't want to know about God because of the way they taught me growing up. <clears throat> and it wasn't until way later that um, I, I got introduced to, uh, to Christianity. Um, my first uh, intake with Christianity was I went to Angelus Temple mm. in Echo Park. We lived out there, um, and um, I had married uh, my first wife. I had two boys from her. Uh, Christian marriage, you know, um, I got married, uh, what's called the house on the hill in Echo Park, Angelino Heights, mm -hmm. um, those, uh, historical houses up there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to attend a Bible study there mm -hmm. at one of those houses and, and I had the, uh, the wedding, the marriage, and that was my introduction. So at a young age, I became a youth counselor, um, an altar worker, you know, they had a radio show of uh, hour, hour of prayer or something like that. From mm -hmm. 11 to midnight, I used to go up there and, and pray for people oh, wow. on the phone, you know, uh, talking to people, dealing with them for an hour. And I did that and uh, I got really involved. And uh, as we, we were kids, we were growing up, you know, and so as we got older, we separated, mm -hmm. you know, she cheated on me. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time I, I had a a 22 unit apartment and uh, I had a job, you know, wow. and I was trying to do the Christian thing and live a Christian life, you know, wow. my two boys running around and she cheated on me. And so that messed things up, mm. you know, so um, uh, she, she, I lost the apartments because uh, the, the, I had to be a married couple. Mm. And so one, one day when I found out that she cheated on me, she, I waited, she didn't come home the weekend and I waited and um, I threw her in the swimming pool. Wow. She didn't know how to swim. Really? And I dunked her head. I wow. was going to take her out. Wow. You know, I was going to take her out. This is it, you know. And um, then afterwards, uh, you know, this guy jumps in and he stops me, you know. 
but I, I was in the heat of the moment. Yeah. You know, you know, um, you know, she did what she did and that's it, you know, mm -hmm. working, being faithful and, um, you know, just, just shattered my heart like that, yeah. you know? So anyway, so then that, that happens. I take off, I go, you know, and, and, um, I, I, I start getting back into drugs mm -hmm. and to cocaine back in them days, you know, we had the disco era, the, mm. the raves, the house parties, you know. So I started doing, you know, smoking weed and, and, and uh, uh, but back then drugs was drugs, you know. Yeah. I, I don't condone it now, but nowadays it's all fake. Mm. And uh, getting coke, you know, uh, acid, you know, smoking. Um, and then eventually, you know, leads off and I get into hardcore, you know, I start, I start slamming heroin. Wow. You know, I start doing heroin, you know, slamming methamphetamine, shooting it. You know, um, I was doing it. I was doing it in prison. You know, uh, I was my best customer. Wow. You know, and I got really, really sucked into the to the things of life. I got real evil. I got real bad. You know, um, uh, I was in Echo. Uh, no, no, no. <clears throat> I was in West LA, uh, Pico and La Brea, mm. and I remember we were selling. And uh, this guy that was with me, you know, he says, hey, does it, there was an iron gate. And then we had a, a run through in case cops come. We know where to uh, an exit. And, and, I, and he says, hey, it's going to be two. It's gonna, let's go to the store. Let's get some more alcohol. And we'll stay here the rest of the night, you know. All right, we'll get some tequila, you know, kick it. You know, we, well, we had drugs, you know. Mm -hmm. So we took off, man. And we start walking. We start walking. That store was closed. So we went to we went to another store. We're walking, and there's like you could hear the music mm. bumping. Bunch of paisas, you know, mm. Mexicans, you know, bumping, you know. And then we looked, you know, turn over like that. See a bunch of guys, and then we heard the guy yell, "Hey, there's that MF," you know. And and they go, "It's a Chewy." And the Chewy looked at me, and he goes, "Run, Robert, run!" Right. So we took off, bro. We started running. You could hear them getting in their cars. You could hear the cars screeching, and they were chasing us, you know. And so we're, we're, we're running, dude. And so we finally zigzag and we come to a street. Mm. It's straight and it's, it's a dead end. Uh, not a dead end, but it's like where the street turns left or right. There's some yeah. apartments and there was an alley. Mm. And, and then I told Chewy, stop, Chewy, Chewy. I go, look, let's split up. I go, you go that way, I'll go this way. We'll meet back at the house. We had already come back from the store. Mm. You know, we had the beer and the tequila and everything and we're coming back. And Chewy goes to the apartments. I start to run to go to the alley and then I heard pop. Man. And then I says, oh, man, I go, they shot Chewy, man. Wow. And I stopped and I turned and I went back and I go, but what if they did it? Mm. I go, what if they just shot at him? Mm. So I turned and I went into the alley. When I went into the alley, three cars are coming and I get hit by the Monte Carlo and I tumble over the car. I hit the window and I fall wow. and I get up and there was a Volkswagen and a Bronco and all these dudes got out, man. And there I was in the front yard. There was like a fence here, mm. the apartments, and there was a little grass area and then the alley. I, I had ran out, and we were right to the front yard. But I was possessed then. I was coked out. Mm. I, was, I was amped up, man. Yeah, yeah. And so I snapped, bro, and I went off, man, and I, I started taking these fools down, man. I wow. took them down. I was like literally, I could literally feel possessed, man. Wow. And I remember there was one guy. He was like a skinny little guy with white. I remember he was all in white. And I had that evil look mm. in my face, man. And I just walked right up to him and I grabbed him like that from the belt buckle and the shirt. And I put him into a parked car. Bam! You know, I put him in. He was in the car like this, bro. And I turned around. I was, I was like monstered out, bro. So when I turned, I turned to go that way to where Chewie was at. And when I turned, the two guys that shot at him came out and put the gun to my face. Just like I did that guy at wow. the restaurant. He put the gun to my face and pulled the trigger and it didn't go off. Wow. We were this close, bro. And it didn't go off. So I turned and I, I turned to run. And at that time I had a little Swiss army knife, the fork, the yeah. knife, the spoon, yep. the little Swiss. Yep. And I had that in my pocket. And I remember he pulled back mm. and I, I reached in to grab my knife when he was, because I had that at that time, the Levi with the mm. wool, you remember mm. those yeah, jackets? Yeah. Yep. I had that back then. Mm. And so when I turned, he had me, man, and I was pulling me and I grabbed the knife and he's trying to shoot. He can't. So he's hitting me with the gun, bro. And at the same time, so I pulled the knife out and I'm leaning back like that and I just start stabbing him, bro. And I, I guess I hit him in the neck because... I heard him gurgling, wow. you know, he was choking on his blood Man. and he lets go. And, and so I turned to run and, and I have the knife and the guy grabs me again. He grabs me again. 
But the intensity of the pull, it tore the, the wool and the jacket. Yeah, you yeah. know, dick yeah, pull that scenes were. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and it tore, bro. Man. And, 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 and when he pulled me back, I didn't know, but the knife closed on my finger. Ooh. But I didn't know, mm. you know, it's adrenaline. adrenaline yep. And he's trying to get me going, and he's trying to get me, and I stab him, mm. and he falls. He gets the gun to go. Boom, right on the side of my head, bro. Goes twice. He got it to go, but doesn't really hit me. And um, he drops, and I finally, and I run. I run across the street, and I'm like, oh, I'm pumped up. I'm all drenched and now, yeah. bro. And I look back, and, and, and somehow or another, you could see him grabbing the fence to get up. He's trying to get up. And then he finally gets himself up, and I look at him, and he gets the gun to go. Boom, you could just see the flash. And there's palm trees. Mm. So I was, like, over there, and I was, like, you know, like that. And then he, I just turn around, and he drops. He falls and um, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I'm all evil now, bro. And so I reached in my back pocket. I grabbed the tequila because I felt the blood coming down my face. Mm. And I popped it. I cracked it. I took a big old swig, bro, and then I poured it on my head. And I took off, bro. Wow. And um, I ended up going to my friend's house. His name is Robert Lopez. He's a carpenter. Oh, really? And um, real cool, real calm, like when I got stabbed on the bus. Mm. I told him, hey, Robert, how's it going, man? He goes, hey, Bob, how's it going, man? I go, hey, can you do me a favor? I says, uh, um, I have no idea. I'm caked. I'm, I'm like drenched in blood, bro. Mm. I'm like, you know, I look like one of those horror movies, yeah. you know. And then he goes, what's up, Bob? I go, no, I go, do you, do you think maybe you can call me an ambulance? You know, uh, I had a little incident right now. <laughs> and then he clicks the porch light on, bro. Oh, man. And, Oh, man, he freaks out, bro. Wow. And he can't, he's so panicky, he can't find the keys to the gate to open the gate. So he calls, he calls 911, the ambulance, they come. And um, they, had a, they had a literally staple my head closed. Um, they had to cut my head all the way open. I have a scar that goes all the way across. And they literally had to peel my cap to, to fix my, my eye because I couldn't, I couldn't lift it. I couldn't open or close it. And that was from getting shot? Um, that was from the gun when he hit me. Because they hit me, with, they pistol whipped me the with pistol, the gun. Yeah. Wow. And they finally got it to go off. Man. You know what I mean? And what, And did you know what this was for? What was it? No, Chewy, they knew Chewy, he, Chewy must have did a bad dope deal with them. And they, you were and, with and them. And owed, he owed them a lot of money, I think. Because they were, they were adamant about getting him. So trip out. Guilty by association. The street life, right? It's yeah, crazy. The street life. Uh, Chaplain Bob always says this payday's not always on Friday. He always says that. Yeah, it's yeah. like you never know when you're going to pay. You think, oh, on Friday I'm going to pay. You have it all set up, and then life just happens. You just pay. It. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, Chaplain Bob, shout out to you, brother, man. He's a good brother right there, man. I met him when I was in jail. Really? Yeah, I was in the behind the, the gates in the county jail, and he'd come in and pray for you. Wow. Little did I know that that prayer was going to be effective. So what happens? That's a crazy story. What happens after prison? Do you like when? When do you? When do you fully kind of encounter God? What was your kind of your process at that time? So I, you a full fourteen years? Yeah. No, I did twelve out of the fourteen. Okay. I uh, I did a eighty five percent. Wow. So I did the twelve years. I was still the stench, man. Yeah. You know, I went through maximum security and I did all the levels and and um, um, I couldn't. I went down to level two. I couldn't adjust to all the openness. Mm. I had to do cell living. So I would mess up and get points, and then they would send me back to level three where the cell living. Mm. Um, um, I did the time that they called my name. I knew the night before, you know, I had everything, you know, here's this, here's that, you know, giving it away, you know. Um, and I, I would just, you know, like, I still didn't believe it was time for me to get out. I was so, um, I had adapted, I had adjusted to prison life. This was my life. This is how I live. This is me. You know, and then the time came where I got released, and um, the next day came, and uh, they called my name, and, you know, the people are yelling, you know, hey, all right, homeboy, you know, you know, good luck, and, you know, the haters, we'll see you back, you know, we'll <laughs> yep. see you later, yep. you know, you, we'll save you a bed, you oh, know, man. and uh, one gate to another gate, and then, they, you know, they ask you a name and a personal question, and, and then another, you know, and then you get out, you get out, and then you get to, <clears throat> you get to this gate. You know, the last, and I'm waiting right there. And the sergeant, I knew her. Mm. And then she goes, hey, Lopez, what are you waiting for? And I go, I'm waiting for you to, cr to click the gate. Yeah. She says, that gate never closed. That's freedom right there. Mm. And I went over there, and I just pushed it, and it just straight open, man. Wow. And um, after doing 14 years, you know, it was just like, it was just different. Everything had changed. Cell phones, 
you know, they had a lot of the, the trains now, mm. you know, running across the cities, you know. Um, I remember one time catching the bus, and I remember, like, the headphones, they have the wires, you yeah, know, like yeah, that. Yeah, yep. And I, I, I had no idea they were speakers, mm. and I thought they were, they were talking to themselves. I, th- <laughs> I thought people were, they had lost it. Oh, man. You know, people weren't crazy, <laughs> you know, but they, uh, they turned out to be, they were talking on the phone, yeah, on the you microphone. know. So a lot of stuff had changed, I, a lot of adjustments, a lot of adapt, you know, how to get in tune with everything that's going on. And, and, and so finally, you know, nobody will take me in. Mm. You know, nobody will take me in after doing 14 years. I had too yeah. much violence, too much too much bad past in my history. You know, no, none of my family members wanted me around. You know, uh, they would tell their nephews, their, their, their sons and daughters, don't hang out with him. He's going to get you killed. He's going to get you dead. He's going to get you hooked on drugs. He's going to have you doing something, you know. And um, so eventually... Um, I go to Highland Park. I live with a daughter, and then I have another daughter. They lived across the street from each other, so I was back and forth. And but they were afraid of me, man. Really? You know, because I, I had that level four mentality, that high high power stuff. You know, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I remember that of my one daughter. She was she my she's she's like me, my Vanessa, mm-hmm. my peanut girl. You know, uh, shout out man, to my my daughter, all of them, and she was letting me stay there but she ended up getting kicked out so that left me no place to go my other daughter you know she i don't blame her you know she had kids you know Mm -hmm. i'm fresh out of 14 years bro you know hardcore stuff you know what i mean so i I don't blame her you know i love my kids so i take off man and i end up in long beach i ended up staying with a cousin out in long beach and i was back up to my old tricks again drinking Mm -hmm. partying getting high you know, uh, I was going back and hanging out on skit roll over there party because it's, it's party life out there. Yeah, it's just yeah. nonstop. Yeah. You know, and I would go out there and hang out. And uh, um, eventually my cousin told me, he goes, hey, bro, you need to leave, bro. You know, I was up to my old tricks. I already knew it was a matter mm-hmm. of time before I snapped, you know. And so I had my stuff packed, my bags ready to go. Um, I was going to head back to the neighborhood. I was going to go back to the streets to what I was familiar with. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten a hold of my sister. And um, <clears throat> um, I had asked her if I could stay there, and she was like, "No, you know what? I, I, we're gonna pray about it. We don't, we don't know, man. You know, you got too much bad history, you know, and we'll get back to you." So that day that that I was leaving, I was ready to hit out the door. The phone rings, and it's her, mm. and she says, "We prayed about it. We fasted." And they're going to Praise Chapel Whittier at this. She time. was a believer. They're, yeah, they're they're Christians, mm. you know, and um, and. So she, she calls, she said, we prayed, we fasted, we're going to let you stay in the garage. Wow. All right, man, thank you, man, because I didn't want to go back to the streets, mm. but I knew I was going to have to do what I had to do. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up, I ended up going, moving the garage. I had an air mattress, a little fan, a little lamp. I didn't care. Mm. I, I, I could survive that. Yeah. You know? Give me some books. Yeah. You know, I'm good. You know what I mean? And uh, eventually, and then they, they invited me to church, and I says, you know, uh, I don't know about that right now. I go, I, I'm not ready for that, you know, mm. but I appreciate the offer, you know. And uh, so <clears throat> what happened was for two months, they they would go to sleep. And when they would go to sleep, I'd sneak out and I'd go party. And I waited till the early morning until they went to work. I'd mm. come back and I'd, I'd, I'd sleep it off. I'd shower and I'd sleep it off, you know. And I did that for like a couple of months. Wow. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the end of this month makes 10 years wow. that I've been out and that I went to Praise Chapel Whittier. Wow, that's amazing, and, and 10 so, years. And so my sister invited me and I said, no. So I'm coming and going from partying for two months. Mm. And one morning I get, I get home, I shower, I go into my room and I lay down and I could feel somebody in my room. I knew somebody was in my room, you know, and I was like, oh, man, so I go, somebody's here to hit me. Wow. You know, somebody's here to take me out, you know. And so I'm laid back. And I always slept with a knife, a shank next to me. You know, so I'm laid back, man. And I just lean over real quick, grab my knife. And I grab, I get up, bro. I get up and I'm, I look around and nobody's in the room. But on the left side of my, of my room, there was a big light. It went, it went like this, the light. And I knew it. I was like, what the heck? Little did I know that I was having an encounter with God. Wow. Little did I know that he personally came to see me. Man. You know, and he told me, you know, he says, he says, look at what you're doing. You're creating another web. 
and you're not going to get out of this one. Wow. And he goes, I need you to come to me. And it was so, so real. It was so, so there. I mean, you know, God was there. I was, I was having a Moses burning bush experience. Man. I was in, I was on, I was on, 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 on uh, holy land, man, mm. you know. And, um, and so I stood home, bro. I, I, I slept, I kicked back, and I waited for them to come home from work. And I asked them, hey, do you remember you offered me to go to church? I go, does that offer still stand? And they says, absolutely. Mm. And so um, I ended up going to church, and nobody knew who I was. I sat in the back. I had this mentality. You know, I'm learning. I'm learning. But the first time I walked into Praise Chapel, I felt like this is where I needed to be. Mm. I belonged here. Wow. I, there was a, a sense of, like, I was like, I'm, I'm home. Yeah. You know. That's amazing. And and um, and from that time on, I just started serving, mopping, cleaning the restrooms, doing whatever. Mm. And little did, because I remember times back, I'd be in prison and I'd be watching the guy preach. Mm. I'd be way in the back. I mm. never sat in the front. And I would watch him preach. And twice, different times, God showed me preaching. Mm. And God told me, you're going to do that. And wow. I kind of laughed. And I kind of <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know. <laughs> And wow. I didn't know nothing about the power of God, really, yeah. at that time. That's amazing. So this is 2012. You're going to hit 10 years going to church. That's amazing, brother, man. You know, the, the amazing thing about God is like he's only, a, it's like a breath away. He's like so close, you know, yeah. as soon as you make that change. And it's been amazing for people that don't follow you on Instagram. They need to because you have a lot of stuff on there, a lot of photos. Every time you go out, testimonies and stuff. When did that start, like your street ministry start? Because did that kind of start right away, a I, couple years in? I do that. I do that not to show me. Yeah. You know, of course, I'm in the pictures yeah. or I do it. But what I do is to be an example. Yeah. To, to show what you need to be doing. Yeah. Where you need to go. What, yeah. what is out there. Because we, like I said, we're in the last hour. Yeah. We're in the last minutes, man. You know, um, you know we're talking about the Euphrates River. Yeah. The Lord says one of my signs that I'm coming back is the river will dry up. It's mm. drying up. You know, and uh, people are still looking for the signs and wonders. I'm like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm listening for the trumpet now. <laughs> yeah, I hear a, I hear a big old rig truck. Is that the trumpet? <laughs> Is that it? Is that it? You yeah. know? Yeah. And and, uh, and it's a trip because even though we do what we do for the Lord, mm -hmm. we don't want to miss it. Yeah. That's that's how I know it. You know. So um, it's 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 amazing how God just started using me. Mm. You know, did that um, start right away or? How? Um, yeah, you know, God just started using me. I I started going to to little events. I used to catch the bus. Had no car. Mm. I used to catch the bus. I used to go far, bro. I used to go far. Didn't know how I was gonna get back, but I'm going. God's mm. called me. And and um, I had an old Honda. They would tell me drive it local. Mm. I took that thing to Banning to oh, to. I went far with it, bro, wow. because God was calling me. Yeah. And I knew God was calling me, and I, I just said, if he's going to get me there, he's going to get me back. And mm -hmm. every time I got back. That's amazing. I have a question for you when it comes to the street life, because you're from where you're from and everything. And, you know, like some people say, blood in, blood out type of thing. What's, what's and, and if you don't want to answer this, you, I, I understand, but I've always wondered that, you know, people that are in the streets, they're part of neighborhoods, they're part of gangs, and then they get saved. What's it like, your relationship going back? Can you go back if they see you? What, what's kind of the relationship? Do they respect people that go to church? And I like, I like that. And, you know, rest his soul, he's in heaven now. You have um, Kilroy. You know, Kilroy from White Fence. He said, I didn't drop out. I dropped into something better. Right. I love that he said that. But talk to us a little bit about that. What's your relationship well, like? I, you know, that, that, that life, I think that when you've done your time and when you've done, your, done what you've had to do, you know, it's it's a no given. You know, it's a respect that you know you did yours already. Mm. You know, it's like retirement plan. Mm. You know, some homeboys are old; they're still out there in the neighborhoods. They don't want to retire. They want to still be active. They still want to be part of it. Yeah. But it's just the way of how God uses us. He He took a foolish thing of this world to confound the wise. Mm. I was a real foolish thing, and little did I know. Like I said, He showed me preaching. I was in South Central LA preaching wow. one time. And I was driving home, and I remember God telling me, do you remember I told you Man. that you were going to be preaching? I literally stopped in traffic, dude. I stopped traffic, and I went, oh, man, I laid, I literally went, wow, wow. God reminded me. That's insane. You know, you couldn't get me in church. Now you can't get me out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're in the <laughs> prayer meetings. I see you all the time there. Your Saturday mornings, like, 
You're you're tapped into everything to do with yeah, the Lord. I, that, it says pull pull down the things of heaven, man. Mm. If you're gonna go, go all the way. Go big or go home. Yep. You yep. know what I mean? And to me, this is the bigger thing right here. Cause I've I've had a hospital ministry before COVID. Yeah. I had a strong, powerful history of uh, of, of seeing people waking up from comas, being delivered, being 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 woken up and 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 it, i think that when when i because i would post this stuff yeah i mean i've been to ronald reagan ucla i've been to usc i've been to torrance i've been to to huntington memorial i've been to so many big hospitals mm. where god has called me and 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 people are broken people are i i've had people that that died but people get saved and delivered in the in the in the, in the waiting room mm. you know god sends me i minister I've had pastors call me in the middle of the night. You know, can you? And yes, absolutely. Wow. It'd be raining. It'd be cold. But there I go. I get That's in my amazing. car and I go do God's work. That's you amazing. Know? Um, I was dealing with an issue, you know, with, with my wife. Um, we're divorced now. Um, that's another woman that, that, that cheated on me, mm. you know. And um, I was coming on the 405 freeway, broken, crying, hard, crying. I was dealing you know, I was so stressed out that I had gotten Bell's palsy. Wow. You know, my face melted. I'm still stiff. I'm still kind of paralyzed here, mm. you know. Um, but I was driving, and I got a call from a pastor saying, can you go to Monrovia? I was close by there. Mm. They didn't know I was where I was at. And uh, can you go pray for this couple in the hospital? Wow. And, and you're going through it. Like, and, you're, and you're going through I'm, your own stuff. I'm, I'm crying. I'm broken on the freeway. The four or five people are seeing me on the freeway crying, mm. broken. And um, I says, yes, I can. Wow. I didn't say no to God. Wow. I went to the parking lot. I parked in the parking lot. And um, I cried, bro. I sat there for at least 45 minutes. I, I had to get a hold of myself. Yeah. I had to just let it go. I let it out. Got my composure. Went in there. Talked to this couple. Prayed for them. Turns out to be they were backsliders. Really? If I don't go, bro, they don't come back to God. Man. <clears throat> if I'm not obedient. Wow. And 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 I think as you're as you're talking about this, you just you had this is I believe your ex-wife, her son passed away right. from a fentanyl. Yeah. Fentanyl is that he, what it was? He, when I met her, he was he was um, he was like I, I would say uh, oh I don't know five or six. Mm. He was little. And I remember the first time I met him at Santa Monica Pier, um, he attached himself to me. He grabbed my arm, mm. and it, it kind of tripped me out, but I didn't push him away. I didn't want him to feel neglected. Yeah. I brought him in. And um, from that time on, him and I became at the hip. Mm. He was always at me, with me, because they were brought up Victory Outreach. Mm. You know, <clears throat> I went there for two years, you know. And um, for her, mm. I sacrificed for her, you know. And because uh, it was all about love, it was all about dedication, it was all about sacrifice. I did everything. Mm. And uh, this really shattered me. It really tore me down. And um, but I'm still going to big outreaches. I'm still with the bullhorn, full blown bells palsy. But I'm out there preaching my heart out. Wow. I'm out there witnessing. I didn't go to the liquor store. I didn't go to the, the drug connection. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't go to the to the hooker. I went to the altar. I went Ooh, to the feet on. of God. I went straight to church. I, I went to where I needed to be because I could have easily went back and yeah. never. I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. I wouldn't be sitting here. And how long ago was that? When did this happen? Um, two, uh, uh, 2018. 18. So just a few years ago, basically. Yeah. So a lot of this is fresh. And so I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm finally like healing now. Yeah. Um, nothing against women. Yeah. Um, but she took that away from me. She, mm. she took right now. Um, I can't fall in love. Mm. It's hard for me to give my heart to somebody because of how broken it was. Yeah, yeah, it's real. How shattered it mm. was, bro. Mm. I mean, that's a pain that I never wish on anybody. Man. You know, you've been shot, stabbed, stitches, yeah. whatever. But a broken heart is the worst thing. Loneliness is the worst thing to ever have. Man. And so I got a hold of myself and I, I said to myself, okay, God, the day will come when you'll know when, you know, and so for me right now, I'm concentrating on the things of God, the kingdom business, yeah. what I have to do. And after all this happened, after the storm, because for six years, I, I went through something. I, got, I hit a wall at 75 miles per hour. I saw that. Your I, car was totaled. I, I spun a 2017 Nissan Altima. I spun. I was waiting to flip and I finally got control of the car. And I saw the wall coming, 
And I just looked at it. I didn't duck or nothing. I just said, the name of Jesus, man. And I looked at the wall and I hit it straight on. And I walked away from that at 75 miles per hour. Two wow. weeks later, um, my neighbor loans me a car. I go to the men's home to go drop them off a check because they, I had got them work. Mm. I went to, I caught uh, the 605 to the, to the 110. And um, no, the 605 to the 5 to the 110. Mm. And I go to Highland Park. I drop the, the, the check off. They pray for me. I pray for them. I give them a word. For some reason or another, they both yelled at the same time. Wow. Confirmation. Wow. And then I left. I caught the three freeways back. And when I got back, the five lug nuts of the tire busted. Wow. And the tire flew off. And I had just got off the freeway, bro. Wow. Three freeways. Wow. And so, and then Isaac passes away. He mm. overdoses on fentanyl. You know, uh, I, it just, all that just shattered me, dude. Everything that was happening for six years, every day, I was just getting hit. Yeah. Hit. It was, it was enough to make you want to go back to drinking, mm. make you want to go back to drugs, make you want to go back to the streets, make you, not me, not me. I, I refuse to, to give that satisfaction to the devil. Mm, I, refuse, I refuse to let him have the last laugh. Mm, that's good. You know, and here I am in victory because of that. Amen. Amen. And everything that happened after that, after the storm, yeah. I come out. But it doesn't mean that it's over. Now I have to find what God wants to do. Right. And now, you know, he's been opening doors. I've been preaching a little bit more, a lot more. I've been ministering. Yeah, like you said, in South Central, I've been seeing you at the churches down there. And last night you were at Let Us Worship in yeah, L.A. And, yeah. Or, or they were in Orange County area. Oh, yeah, the, the California will be saved. Yeah. You know, that's a powerful movement right there. That's amazing. They're going all the way down the coast from San Diego to San Francisco. It's amazing. And we've followed them, and their last stop is in San Francisco. So um, it's just a touch of God, yeah, what yeah. we need. Yeah, you know, that's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that because, you know, I, I, that was really important, I think, that you shared that because a lot of times people think, like, the Christian life is easy mm. or it's like, you know, they see how you were back then, now you're in church, now they say stuff and make fun of you, but it's like, we go through our stuff. If anything, it's harder to be in Christ because it's easy to go out and do your thing. It's easy to go out and get high, go with the girls, whatever. Like, that's dime a dozen, you know, that's easy. Yeah. It's a, it takes a real man to walk with God. It takes there, a real man like you to be like, I'm not going to go back. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to walk this out. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, there's a story that I, I, I've told that I, I heard of someplace. There's a man that, that gets invited to go to a tour um, where they grow roses. And, and he gets on the bus. And he, there's five buses. And they go out. And they go to these, these immense fields of roses. They're growing them. And they get off the buses and they get in groups and they take off and the, everybody has a guide for a group and they're walking, they're walking and they're all looking at the roses, they're looking and the man catches one and he looks at it, he can't take his eyes off of it, he needs to have that rose. And the guide, he sees it, he's falling back, he's falling back and finally he catches up with him and he tells him, hey, he goes, I see you saw that rose, you like that rose? He goes, man, that's the most beautiful, it's perfectest rose I've ever seen. And he pulls in his pocket, he grabs a pocket knife, and he goes, if you can go get that rose and cut it at the right angle, he goes, I'll let you have it, man. The man gets the knife, and he takes off, and he runs into the bushes of the roses. Mm. And he goes, and he goes, and he goes, and it's way in there, man. And he goes in, and he cuts it, and he grabs it, and he looks at it, man. He's like, wow. And he's walking back now. He's, like, enthralled now. He's not running back. He's, like, you mm. know, he's... He's mesmerized. He's, he's tranced. And he walks out, man. He goes, look, look, I got the rose. And everybody's looking at him at amazement like, what the heck? Because he didn't realize that he got all cut up, all scarred, all ripped apart from the, the thorns of the mm. roses. He was all bleeding. He was all cut up. Mm. So the moral of this story is you have to tell the story of your scars before you can share the beauty of your rose. Amen. Amen. That's it. And, and, and now I believe God's allowing me to show the, the beauty of my flower now. That's amazing. You know, after sharing my scars. That's amazing. And it's hardcore. It's, 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 it's messed up. And I know there's people that have been through worse than me. Yeah. But it's what God gave me to use for what I do now. Yeah. You yeah. know, I can look at parent people with transparency. Mm -hmm. I can understand. I can realize that when I minister, when I preach, uh, people can come up and say, I needed to hear that. Mm. You know, I needed to hear from somebody. I've had pastors call me, guys that want to get out. You know, blood in, blood out. You know, once, you, once you're involved with Christ, 
God will protect you. Now, there's people that are connected. They want to get out for the stupidest reasons. Yeah. They're not going to let it go. Mm. You know, you owe. Mm. But when you've done your time and they see that you're doing the right thing, that yeah. you're making an effort, that you're, you know, then you're good. Mm. And now I can find myself now going back to my neighborhood. Really? I can find myself now talking to old homeboys, homegirls that give me the respect knowing now that I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. I'm a, wow. a, a man of God now. That's amazing. I want you to tell the story really quickly because I saw that you posted it on uh on Facebook, it was uh, Sonny, Ar Sonny Arganzoni from Victory oh. Outreach. You saw him at the, this was the, is this was in East I LA at the time? I was a kid, the first church on St. Louis. Mm. We were little kids running around because I grew up in, on, on, on Brooklyn and Soto. So we ran the area, man. We ran wow. the streets. And we were running right there. And he had the old white house mm. right there. And it had the steps go up. And we were running around, and he was outside doing something in the front. Mm. And he goes, hey, what are you guys doing? And we're going, we're being knuckleheads, man. <laughs> I told him, you know, and he looked at me, and he says, well, why don't you guys come in and be knuckleheads for Jesus? Oh, man. You know, and, I, and, and for the other guys, nah, 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 forget that Jesus, man, mm. but not me. I was like, all right, let me check it out. And mm. he, he got up, and he took me inside. And, really? And he showed me around the old wooden pews, and, and, and they were this way, and the, the old wooden stage. And, and I went in there, and he started talking to me about God and wow. Jesus. And, and I had a one-on-one -on -one with him because nobody was in there. Wow. And I ended up going back a few times. You know, really? I ended up going back, and I never went back after mm. that. Mm. You know, but that was my encounter with Sonny Arganzoni. Little did I know wow. that he would be the powerful man that he is of God now. Yeah. And so when I ran into him in this picture that I took, mm -hmm. I reminded him of that story. Oh, did you? Yeah. And <laughs> he had that look like he kind of remembered it, you wow. know, but he's had so many encounters. So yeah, many, he's talked to so many you know, people. Yeah, so many people, New York, you know, the streets, you yeah. know, and everything like that. So yeah. um, I think he also had a play and a hand in my salvation, mm. planting seed, mm. tilling the dirt. Yeah. You know, uh, Nikki Cruz. I, I've yeah. met Nikki Cruz. Oh, have you? Um, yeah, uh, uh, Little Willie G. Mm -hmm. I, I met him at a VO conference in Long Beach. Really? I had a big Bible. He signed it, Jeremiah 29, 11. Wow. You know. And, and we're talking about Kilroy as well, too. You're connected Kil with oh, him. Oh, Kilroy, I knew him forever, you know, growing up. And um, he always instilled in me and always gave me good advice, good word. You know, he would always call me, let's go hang out, let's go, are you going to this event, you know? And he used to always tell me, homie, don't you know me? <laughs> you know, homie from Wyoming, you Man. know? And, and for those that don't know his story, he was also from White Fence, right? Yeah. Really well respected, yeah. spent a lot of time in prison, and was one of the original members of... The Emmy. Wow. Yeah, he was connected, you know, uh, the, the street life, you know, yeah. it was just, that was it, but... He found God. God he found did. him. Mm. You know, there's a lot of uh, stories of men that find God. Yeah. You know, that become pastors, become evangelists. You yeah. know, um, that God has used to 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 do the things that, for the glory of God. Yeah. You know, the, for the kingdom. Yeah. You know, um, um, it's amazing. It's it, amazing. It, my respects. You know, because uh, we we don't we don't see a way out. Mm. We don't see no 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 light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're growing up in the neighborhood with gangs and drugs, you don't see that. Mm -hmm. You just see dead ends. You know, roadblocks. You know, prison walls. You know, and um, and when you do see that light at the end of the tunnel, you you're afraid. You're scared. You don't want to make that step because it's it's new. You don't know what's there. But once you take that first step and you get involved and you go and you get further, you get further. Later on down the line, you say, "Man, I should have did this a long time ago." Me finding Christ or Christ finding me, God finding me was the best thing that ever happened to my life. Amen. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm living sober. Um, I, I remember what I did the night before. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have a job. Thank God, bless me with a car, you mm -hmm. know. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm well respected now, you know, in the, in the Christian community. Yeah. You know, I, I take the time and the effort to go see you, to go meet with you, to go talk with you, to go pray with you, because I know, I know that hurt. I know that pain. I know what it's like to, to feel worthy of nothing, less of anything. You know, desperate. You know, all you have to do is cry out to Christ, man. Amen. All you got to do is call out to God. Amen. You know, and, 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 and that's the best thing that you could ever do. And I wouldn't change it for anything now. You know, it gets better. Amen. It gets better. Glory to glory. Let's go. Well, thank you, Brother Robert, for being on here. I really appreciate it. Your story, your testimony, like you said, it's not just, you know, 
just sharing war stories just back then it's about like what god got you through and like you said people have crazier testimonies people don't have as crazy a testimony it doesn't matter this is your story yeah. this is what you went through the power of god so amazing so um i just want to say thanks again just for being here just for blessing us with that it, it really means a lot to me and, and it's amazing just to see you just out there doing your <laughs> thing and just man speaking to the youth yeah you know and everything like that so usually we don't do this but i wanted to ask you something real quick would you mind just praying on the podcast sure. maybe someone's watching this right now and it's just like they're down and out they're doing their thing or maybe they have family yeah. like you say your family didn't want nothing to do with you your family has seen you kind of go through it but like your sister she god gave her the peace to say you know what brother robert he needs it he needs a chance move him in Let, yeah. let's get him because going. of that i am where i'm at because yeah. she gave me that chance yeah she gave me the opportunity my 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 respects to louis and tish my sister my brother-in-law for taking a chance on me and uh, now they see that they, I can't get out of church. I'm, I'm dedicated. You know, yeah. faithful prayer on Saturdays, you yeah. know, church on Sundays. You know, I go to events way late at night, but I still get up to go to church, mm. you know. Faithful. You know, faithful to the kingdom of God. Like because, you were faithful in the streets to that. And because God right? is faithful to us. Come on. So anyway, I encourage you guys out there, you know, that if uh, you're hurting and if you're in pain or you're dealing with stuff, you know, um, I just want you to know that it, it, it's not all that. It's just a circumstance, it's a situation that you can't let it overcome you. You can't let it get the best of you. Um, don't let it defeat you. You know, it's just a test. It's a trial. You know, and if you don't know Christ, you know, we're going to pray right now that, that, that God will touch your heart and your life. And um, I'm a living miracle. I'm proof that there is a God, that God can change people. So I encourage you right now to think about it um, there's really not much to think about. It's a, a choice and a decision that, that uh, later on you'll thank yourself for making. You know, so I, I want to pray for you right now and I pray for everybody, for your podcast, thank you. for everything that's going on. Father, we praise you. We glorify you. We, we love you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you for guiding us and for giving us direction, for being our spiritual GPS, for taking us to and from and from and to, Lord that you have blessed the, the roads, Lord, that you have snapped the plumb line, that you have made every crooked road straight, Father, that you have entrusted us with your Holy Spirit. I pray for a broken heart right now. I pray for someone that is dealing with, with, uh, with uh, uh, being backstabbed, for being hurt, for being shattered. I pray for that person that's drug addicted that's about to get high right now that comes across this podcast, for someone that's taking that drink, that it would be their last drink, I pray for that prostitute, that homosexual. I pray for that youth, that kid that is out there that's being peer pressured, that, is, that has no way out, that wants to commit suicide. I rebuke it. I come against it. I pray for love, peace, and joy, and happiness in that kid's life. I pray, Lord, that their paths will cross, Lord, with someone of, of, of you, Lord, the, the kingdom things, Father, for that single mom, Lord, that she's struggling and that she's going through it, Lord, that she doesn't find no way out, that she would find you, Lord, that you will help her to get out, Lord, for that man, Lord, that's looking for work, for, for a job, Lord, or, or a way to support his family. For It's rare now for a man to be uh, a family now, Lord. And I pray that you touch that, that heart, that soul, Lord. I pray for our mothers and our, and our aunts and uncles, for our families. I pray for salvation upon them all. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint them and touch them and bless them. I pray for Manny and his wife, Lord, and, and for his situations that he deals with, that he goes through, because we're all human, God, that we deal with stuff. So I pray a special prayer upon him that, that you will continue to anoint this podcast and what he does, his music, his wife's music, that she would go off the charts, Lord. He would be touched by that, God, that he will continue to be a leader and a director, Lord, and to pass, Lord, that, that the, the things that he hears in these podcasts, Lord, that it would be an asset to his life, Father. I pray for my brother over there, Lord, that you would touch him and his family, Lord, the sound man, that you would touch him, God, and that you would anoint him and bless him and, and, and guide him and give him strength and the courage, Lord, and, and the stamina to stand strong and to continue to push forward, that he would push his plow, that he would, he would till hard ground, Lord. And for myself, Lord, I pray that you continue to use me and anoint me and touch me. And you take me where the places nobody wants to go, God. I am willing, Lord. I am ready and able. And I thank you, Father God, for the things that you have done in our lives, God. We thank you for the miracles, Father. And most importantly, we thank you, Jesus, for your blood that you shed on Calvary. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. 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 Well, thanks again, Brother Robert. Man, I hope you guys were blessed by that podcast. I feel so encouraged right now. I feel blessed. I feel the Holy Spirit in here. I know you guys are feeling it out there. So thank you guys again just for joining us. I encourage you guys, follow Brother Robert. Check him out on Instagram. He has so many amazing stuff going on. It'll encourage you, like he said, not just to give himself glory, but just to encourage other people to go out and do something, reach people, reach the lost. That's what it's all about, winning souls for Christ and just making disciples. So we'll see you guys on the next episode. Have a good one.